Tonight, America says goodbye to Peter Jennings, a giant in the news business for five decades. I'm David Gregory. Let's play hardball. Good evening, I'm David Gregory, in for Chris Matthews tonight. As you undoubtedly heard by now, Peter Jennings died last night at the age of 67 after a short but valiant struggle against lung cancer. Tonight, we've asked some of his closest friends and competitors for their memories, including Tom Brokaw, Ted Koppel, and Cokie Roberts. Later on Hardball, Robert Bork, perhaps the most famous Supreme Court nominee who never made it to the high court. We'll get his views on the fight ahead over Judge John Roberts. But we begin tonight with reaction to the stunning loss of Peter Jennings. I spoke today to Nightline anchor Ted Koppel and asked him what went through his mind when he got the sad news. Well, I'm thinking that, that uh, you know, Peter and I shared something that, unfortunately, I don't share with anyone else at the network, and that is we were sort of here at the beginning. Uh, I was joined in 63, he in 64. ABC was not only third, it was probably fifth out of a three-network battle. It was a pathetic little news division. Uh, and we were a couple of pathetic young reporters who didn't know anything and were trying very hard to pretend that we did. Uh, and uh, that was the source of both great amusement but also great pride uh, for the two of us over the years to be able to look back on what it used to be and what it became. And it's a unique experience to be with a friend and a colleague where you're actually instrumental in building something. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, we were, we were so low on the totem pole when we joined ABC and so hoping that we, I mean, it's a simple fact of the matter that NBC wouldn't have had us, CBS wouldn't have had us. We were much too young, much too inexperienced. Uh, and it was just a great joy to be able to work at it together and ultimately to see ABC emerge as this great news powerhouse. What captured you about his life story? So much was made about the fact that he didn't graduate high school. Uh, he, he had a crack at the big job and it didn't go so well early on and then he gets it later on in his career. Yeah. Um, what really got me about Peter was the determination he had to make up for what he would have been the first to admit was a huge mistake. He dropped out of high school when he was a sophomore. Uh, he was so eager to get to work in broadcasting and, as he himself put it, bone lazy when it came to schoolwork, that he spent the rest of his life catching up. And boy, did he. Peter Jennings was the best self-educated man I have ever known. Whenever he would come into a new city overseas, he would make it a point to contact Whoever the smartest people in town were, whether those were politicians or military people or other journalists or academics, and he would invite these people out for a drink or invite them out to dinner. And Peter's great quality was that he had this capacity of making you feel that he was so interested in what you were saying. And he wasn't faking it. He really was. When he traveled, he traveled with an extra suitcase that was always filled with books. So Peter educated, continued to educate himself all the while he was alive. So he had a lousy formal education and a brilliant homeschooling. I, I had a mentor tell me early on that if you, you can do an easy test about whether you want to be a reporter, is are you genuinely curious about things? Yes. And that was certainly him. Yeah, absolutely. He was genuinely, genuinely curious and he was just fascinated by people who knew more than he did. And he sopped it up like a sponge. Tell me something about him that would not be apparent if you were just a lifelong viewer. Um, this very cool, aloof, controlled anchor man was a real softie. I mean, a genuinely sentimental, loving human being. Uh, I, uh, I remember one time he and I were in New York, very young, in our 20s. And uh, we were stopped by a panhandler, and both of us reached into our pockets and gave the guy a buck. And I moved on, and Peter did not. He stopped and talked to the man for about 10 minutes. And uh, I realized that what Peter doing was a far greater act of charity than what I had just done. And it really wasn't even charity. He felt that uh, what this man needed was the dignity of recognition. 
the dignity of someone paying attention to him, talking to him as an individual, not just someone to be handed a dollar and ignored. And that was, that little story, I think, tells more about who Peter Jennings was uh, than maybe much of what was seen on the air. What about his view of the world and his experience, particularly in the Middle East, as a young correspondent for ABC News, and how that informed his later reporting, how it informed his role as an editor and an anchor, ultimately with 9-11 and in the wake of 9-11. How did all of that come together? Peter, you have to remember, was the first uh, American television bureau chief in the Arab world. When he and ABC News set up that bureau in Beirut, there was no other network news bureau anywhere in the Arab world. And that meant that Peter was covering a story that was almost entirely covered on television from the Israeli side, but Peter was covering it frequently uh, from the Arab side. He was often and unfairly portrayed as being anti-Israeli. He was not. He really was not. Uh, and uh, there was just a great fundamental decency to him and a determination that difficult as it might be, uh, that he believed not that every story has equal and opposite uh, points of view that are equally legitimate, but that the Arab side of the story deserved to be told, and he was determined to do that. And that informed every story that Peter ever covered. He was always interested in knowing what else is there to it? What is the other point of view? Did he care about something more than anything else? I'm sure he did. I don't know what it was. As a, as a journalist? Uh, he cared about context. He cared about fairness. He cared about making sure that, uh, that people understood more than just the, the quick surface story. Uh, you know, as you know, being in the business, uh, his greatest gift as an anchor was to appear unruffled and to be able to give context to a story at a time that some guy is yelling in his ear that if you don't go to guest number one, he's going to walk out. We've got 30 seconds before you have to go to this live shot that we have coming in from wherever it is. There might be people handing you cards from left and right. And yet the impression that Peter conveyed was that he was always completely in control, uh, had a, an absolute sense of where he was coming from and where he was going. Uh, and on top of all of that, he was a soothing presence. That was almost unique. I don't think there's another anchor out there who was as good at that as Peter Jennings. In his sickness and then in his death, he was so dignified. And, uh, but you, I can't help but wondering what these last terrible months have been like for him personally. Um, he was fighting it until the very end, and I think was determined to believe that, uh, that he could still beat it. Uh, I don't know at precisely what point he came to the conclusion that he would not, uh, but I do know that I was with him about 10 days ago and uh, asked him whether he wanted to talk about death and dying, and for the first time he said yes. So I have a pretty good sense that certainly a couple of weeks ago, Peter must have known, uh, but he was determined not to give up as long as there was any chance. Are you willing to share some of his thoughts about dying? No. Was he angry? Did he accept it? No. Uh, he was certainly not angry. Uh, I, I think that there are many things he regrets. He's got uh, two, when I say young, in their early 20s, uh, children of whom he is enormously proud. He loves, he loved his wife Casey dearly. Uh, and she was an absolute tower of strength, has been throughout this entire process. Uh, he had a great deal to live for, uh, but he, he always said, and I am sure meant it, that he had lived a very, very good and full life. Uh, and so I think perhaps in one small portion of his brain, he was willing to accept that he had packed more into 67 years than some people pack into 97. This is such an abrupt and sad end uh, to an era with Tom Brokaw and Rather and now Peter Jennings. Uh, 
out of the chair and unfortunately uh, not with us any longer. You are also leaving. What does it mean not only to our business but to m most importantly to the viewers about the fact that this era is closing? Um, I think it means just that. This era is closing and that means that another era is beginning and I don't think that always has to be seen as a uh, cause for, you know, great alarm. There are talented younger correspondents like yourself who are going to move in and you will do it in your way and I'm sure you will do it brilliantly. Uh, and it's, it's only fair to remind people that when Tom and Dan and Peter and Ted came on the scene, uh, there were people who bemoaned the fact that Chet and David and Walter uh, and Eric and some of the other great names that young people today don't even know, the Brinkleys and the Huntleys and the Cronkites and the Severides uh, and the Reynolds, uh, there was that same feeling of alarm that it's never going to be the same. All the old rocks, all the old great ones are leaving. Well, that's in the nature of life. Uh, people get old, they leave, and then younger, talented people come in and take over. Ted Koppel, thanks very much. Thank you. And still to come tonight, Tom Brokaw and Cokie Roberts remember Peter Jennings. Later on MSNBC, don't miss Rita Cosby's new show live and direct premiering tonight at 9 p.m. Eastern. And the situation with Tucker Carlson going live tonight at 11 p.m. Eastern. We'll be right back. This is Hardball only on MSNBC. What do you get? When a financial firm with 66,000 people in 50 countries takes the time to understand your needs like it's just the two of you. Could it be the most powerful two-person financial firm in the world? You and us. UBS. With Sprint, people are experiencing BMW in a whole new way. Using wireless kiosks powered by Sprint, customers can build their own all-new 3 Series and ask for a test drive. Because the more new people BMW reaches, the more BMWs wind up on the road. With Sprint, BMW is accessible, interactive, beautiful. Learn more at Sprint.com. Coming up, the life of Peter Jennings is remembered by former anchor and managing editor of NBC Nightly News' Tom Brokaw. When Hardball returns. Your Smart Start lessons. You need four bowls of Smart Start to get the vitamin C in one bowl of total. Your grape nuts. More than ten bowls to match total calcium. Chef recommends two spoons. Two spoons. <laughs> special K for you. And even twenty bowls of original Special K couldn't equal the whole grain in total. Only Total has 100% whole grain, 100% of 12 vitamins and minerals, and 100 calories. We'll take okay, total. total. Sorry, no substitutions. Total, one bowl, 100%. Research fields. Visit us online to find out how we can serve you. TIAA CREF Financial Services for the Greater Good. I want to call anywhere, anytime. And not worry about the cost. You can. How? Easy. With digital phone from Time Warner Cable, you get unlimited calling anywhere in the United States and Canada for one low rate, free caller ID, and much more. And digital phone provides enhanced 911. With All-in-One, you can save up to hundreds of dollars a year when you get digital cable, Roadrunner, and digital phone together. We, we want, want it. Cool. Just call Time Warner Cable and ask for digital phone and All-in-One today. Call me. Really? Uh, of course. So, did you kiss her? Two more weeks, Dad. I'm cutting you loose. Your student driver's going solo. Don't insure him with just anybody. Rethink your car insurance and see State Farm agents Steve Fisher or Julie Stoll for the right coverage at the right price. You'll get the young driver discounts and coverage you need now. Did he kiss her? It's why more families trust State Farm.
Welcome back to Hardball. I'm David Gregory. In tonight for Chris Matthews, Koki Roberts of ABC News covered politics side by side with Peter Jennings. And also today, she told me what it was like to lose a friend and a colleague. Yes, but one of the nice things is that we have an opportunity to talk about him. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is uh, one of the advantages of mourning a public person, is that uh, you get to say all of the things that you feel about them. Mm -hmm. how, is, how did he handle the end? How did he handle these last months? He was unbelievable. Uh, the idea that, of course, he had to come on the air and announce to the world uh, what his diagnosis was, which is terribly difficult to do, and, and you could tell from that broadcast how difficult it was. And um, then he stayed in touch by email and, and stayed in touch with his program all the time, and uh, I think cheered everybody else up. Was he prepared for this? Is one ever prepared for this? Uh, I think the, the hard thing is, is leaving your family. and. Um, even if you're ready to make peace yourself, you don't you don't want to miss that. And and Peter loved being a dad. It was something he was incredibly proud of, was how good a dad he was. And I'm sure it broke his heart to realize that he would never meet his grandchildren. So hard with a family, particularly given what his life was over these many years and how many, how much uh, sacrifice was involved in doing what he did, to still carry on as a father. Yes, but it's something he felt very strongly about. Uh, many times he talked to me about that, mm -hmm. about the fact that he uh, was a, felt that he was a really good dad and that that was so important to him. And famously, on September 11th, when he was carrying on just incredibly uh, through the day and night, the one time that he really choked up on the air was when he was t had talked to his own children and realized how frightened they were and trying to tell other parents to talk to their children. What stands out to you among your reflections, among the stories in your mind about him? We, we covered, of course, a lot of elections together and election nights, long election nights, especially 2000. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, his love of America in the end turned out to be something that surprised me because he was a Canadian and he honored his Canadian heritage and he, he uh, felt such a strong tie to both his father and his mother uh, that I think he thought it dishonored them to become a U.S. citizen. But then he traveled the country so much and learned so much about it through, through his political reporting, through the books, uh, that he really fell in love with this country. And on Election Day 2004, uh, he was so excited because he had voted. And uh, it was like a little kid, you know, I voted. And, uh, and, <laughs> and the first time. For the first time. And that was something that last night when I got the news just made me so sad because I thought that was the only time he got to vote. Mm -hmm. What did he care about most? I think he really cared about getting the news to people. Uh, you know, that's what we all say we care about. But I think that he had inc insatiable curiosity and he uh, wanted to get all those things he was learning and having so much interest learning, he wanted everybody else to learn. And, uh, and of course he made it so accessible to people. Um, I think that the way that he did live broadcast was just genius. And one of the things that was ingenious about it was that he never pretended that he was sitting by himself at that anchor desk without a lot of other things going on. If, if he was getting news in his ear, he'd say, wait a minute, hold on, I'm hearing in my ear, you know, or he'd ask for information and a piece of paper would show up and he'd say, thank you very much. I mean, he wasn't uh, the voice of God sitting up there. He was Peter Jennings, the anchor, with a whole lot of other people in the background helping out. You talk about politics in a town w with a lot of people with a lot of smart things to say about our political life. Um, what did he add that was different? I think uh, he, he brought the perspective of somebody who hadn't uh, grown up in American politics and had had to learn it as a grown up. And that, uh, that is different. It's, um, it's looking at it from a fresh view. And uh, he was always uh, really rather startled by it, uh, sometimes, sometimes naively so, which is a wonderful thing in a reporter because we tend to be so cynical about these things. Final 
question. What does it mean to you that this era that everybody's talking about with the, uh, the big three now gone and this such an abrupt and sad end to this, to this chapter, what does it mean to the viewers of what we do? I think that viewers are now going to have to adjust to the idea that people that they have been familiar with for decades are no longer the reliable voices, faces bringing them the news. And then they have to decide who is and, and where they want to get that information. Uh, my son is almost 37 years old and he pointed out to me not too long ago that basically his entire sentient life uh, these three guys had been uh, the anchors of the of the network broadcast and uh, that is that's something I had not thought about until he said that and uh, this is a huge change for Americans in terms of how they get their news. A big loss. Koki, our condolences and thanks. Thank you. Koki Roberts of ABC News. And when we return, NBC's Tom Brokaw. But first, here is Peter Jennings reporting on the attack at the 1972 Munich Olympics. If I were to guess at the moment at which of the commando organizations this group is to come from, I'd be most likely to narrow in on a group called Black September. The Middle East, uh, Israel and the Arab countries is like one of the evil pendulums of history which just goes back and forth and back and forth hitting all sorts of inconsistency and misunderstanding every time it makes a move. You buy ginger ale at Walmart's everyday low prices. It arrived on a Walmart truck and traveled over 140 miles from a Walmart distribution center where it was processed by over 1,000 Walmart associates and moved over 10 miles of conveyor with over 230,000 cases that same day. Why send ginger ale through one of the most efficient distribution systems ever conceived? To keep prices low for you. And we're all proud to be a part of it. the road you expect your car to perform well but if your engine isn't clean it may not perform at its best shell v power premium gasoline can help it actively cleans your engine for better performance so no matter where you're going with shell v power you'll be able to enjoy the performance shell v power actively cleans for better performance who is he and why are you still here I see you met Johnson's new intern. Wait a minute, Johnson gets an intern? Introducing Kellogg's Toasted Honey Crunch. So crunchy, so honey, so clustery, so good. That's great. Why don't we just give him my corner office? It's a great idea. They could use the space. I'm sending you a death ray. No, it's a death ray. Forget new it. Kellogg's Toasted Honey Crunch. Sounds good. Big pharmaceuticals are right up there with the arms dealers. Two outsiders will risk everything to expose the truth. Chaos, unmarked graves, yes. murder. Ripped from the headlines comes an edge of your seat thriller. The English patient's Rafe finds Rachel Vice. Constant Gardner. Rated R. Uncover the conspiracy. August 26th. If you're a homeowner with an adjustable rate mortgage, what happens to your monthly payment if the rates go up again? Well, if you have a $200,000 mortgage at 6% APR, a 1% increase in the APR will actually increase your monthly payments by 11%. That equals an extra monthly payment every year. Want peace of mind? Lock in a new low fixed rate loan from Ditech.com while rates are still near their two-year lows. Log on to Ditech.com or call 1-800-71-FIXED. Put America's space program back on track and put themselves in the record books. But will future shuttle missions be grounded for good? Countdown, tonight at 8 on MSNBC. Anita Cosby made you a promise. We're going to break news. And when jurors from the Michael Jackson case wanted to tell their story, they told it to Rita. Do you believe that this jury let a guilty man go free? And what they're saying will shock you. The interview everyone will be talking about on the premiere of Rita Cosby Live and Direct, tonight at 9 on MSNBC.
and welcome back to Hardball. I'm David Gregory in tonight for Chris Matthews. Even though they were fierce competitors, Dan Rather, Tom Brokaw, and Peter Jennings were most importantly friends and colleagues. They covered the major news of the day with class and dignity and defined what network news was to become for generations. Now that Peter Jennings is gone, we turn to Tom Brokaw, the former anchor and managing editor of NBC Nightly News, for some perspective on his friend and the legacy he leaves behind. Tom is in Montana tonight. Tom, thanks for being here. My pleasure, David. Did you have a sense uh, that the end was this near? I did, actually. I, I talked to Casey last week. He'd had a very rough weekend, the weekend of his 67th birthday. And then there was a small turn for the better, but all the indications were that um, that the end game was very close and that they were preparing to deal with that. Uh, she didn't express that. They, they wanted to fight to the end. I had a remarkable conversation with Peter at the beginning of his treatment when he said to me, realizing the mortality rates for lung cancer, I told my family I just want to lie down and go away. But the response from the American people has been so overwhelming, I feel I owe it to them as well as my family to fight on. But this is a particularly a devastating illness, as you know, lung cancer. I've now lost nine friends to lung cancer, and the calendar is almost always unforgiving in the way that it was for Peter. F a five-year rate of, of survival, uh, less than 50 percent. I mean, it's, it's very mm -hmm. difficult to wage a long battle with this, isn't it? It is, and it's, and it's um, if I may, this is my uh, portable soapbox, it's all about cigarettes and smoking, uh, for the most part, uh, lung cancer. You talk to any major doctor in this country, whether they're, in, they're involved in cancer research or just general practitioners, and they'll tell you if they could change one thing in America, they would eliminate cigarettes because they bring on so many devastating health consequences, and the cost to the society as a result of that are just enormous. And Peter. Uh, you know, I, my, one of my first memories of Peter is that he was a very heavy smoker. Mm -hmm. Now, he smoked like he did everything else with great style. He always had the little Cartier lighter, and he did it with a certain panache. But he was a heavy smoker, and my guess is that uh, what we're witnessing today are the consequences of that. What, did he talk at all about that, Tom, in, in these past months? Was he angry at himself? for being a smoker. I know that in some of his reporting on the tobacco industry, he'd always been very even-handed uh, and without any particular resentment for the tobacco companies that some people may feel uh, of that generation. No, I don't think so. I, um, we didn't talk about that. I, didn't, I really stayed in touch more with Casey after that initial conversation just to kind of on a weekly basis to see how he was doing to let him know that we were here if they needed anything. Uh, I think that the concentration for the past several months has been on his treatment and trying to get beyond uh, the condition that he was in. Uh, he had no illusions about how uh, difficult this fight was going to be. Neither did his friends. And it, it was very tough at the end in terms of weight loss and that kind of thing. But he put up a heroic battle. And as, as I said earlier today, Peter would also want us to acknowledge that uh, this goes on in American families every day across this country, that they're fighting cancer in one form or another. Uh, Peter was a very high profile case. And maybe as a result of that, we'll make some gains on lung cancer. But it's a very tough disease. Much more with Tom Brokaw in just a moment. But first, here is Peter Jennings talking about covering the 9-11 attacks. I almost lost it a couple of times on 9-11. Uh, most specifically, when I turned around to find that my children had called from two parts of the country. I checked in with my children, and it, uh, who were deeply uh, stressed, as I think young people are across the United States. And uh, so if you're a parent, you got a kid in some other part of the country, call them up. You count on Office Depot for your tech needs, so count on us for hers. Now exclusively at Office Depot, an HP Pavilion with Intel Pentium 4 processor, 15-inch LCD monitor and printer, and $859.99 value at just $589.99 after mail-in rebates. Designed specifically for students at a price designed for you. So come in today. Office Depot.
there's a new synthetic in town. Pennzoil Platinum. Relearn what you know about synthetic at PennzoilPlatinum.com. And notice the delicious bowl of Quaker oatmeal. Presto Chango, oatmeal squero. Ah. Quaker breakfast squares, it's oatmeal to go. There's an easier way to freshen the whole room. Blade plug-in scented oil fan. The first air freshener that uses a quiet fan. So it actively circulates your favorite fragrance throughout the entire room. There. Isn't that better? Freshness with a spin. Plug it in, plug it in. Now enjoy the freshness of clean linen with Glade plug-in scented oil fan. Off. And so are over 8,000 other pair during our women's half off back rack sale. Now in progress at Bob Jones Shoes, 19th and Grand, downtown. Kansas City heard about Time Warner Cable's newest channel, Kansas City On Demand. It's all about Kansas City and the people and places that make us such a great town. Just turn to Channel 113 and browse the categories. You'll find the best of Metro sports, local businesses, movie reviews, music videos, the arts, and more. All available anytime you want to watch. Kansas City On Demand, Channel 113, only from Time Warner Cable. Find out how Pierce Medical Clinic can help you with weight loss. Tune to Kansas City Marketplace on Channel 113 and select Health and Beauty. MSNBC's The Situation with Tucker Carlson. Every time I see Dick Cheney say anything, I hear these words. Hey, you kids, get off my lawn. <laughs> yeah, that's why they give lethal injections. Sucking up to the evil Saudis, they've got a third of the world's oil. The Situation with Tucker Carlson, the only cable news show live at 11, begins tonight on MSNBC. Hello, everyone. I'm Melissa Rayberger, and here's what's happening. President Bush signed into law a sweeping energy bill today. It seeks to encourage homegrown energy production by giving billions in tax breaks to energy companies. For consumers, the bill provides tax credits for buying hybrid gas electric cars and making energy conservation improvements by buying better windows and appliances. The measure also extends daylight saving time by a month beginning in 2007 to save energy. The signing came on a day that oil prices jumped to $1.63. They closed at a record record high of $63.94 a barrel. The government also announced the average price of gasoline nationwide jumped nearly eight cents during the past week. They're now a record high $2.37 a gallon. And NASA hopes to land the shuttle Discovery at Cape Canaveral early tomorrow morning after postponing a landing today because of cloudy skies. If the weather is still bad in Florida, Discovery could land at Edwards Air Force Base in California or in New Mexico. Back to Hardball. Welcome back to Hardball. I'm David Gregory in tonight for Chris Matthews. And we are back with NBC's Tom Brokaw from Montana talking about the loss of Peter Jennings. Tom, tell me how you got to know Peter Jennings, what uh, your first meeting was like. Uh, we met in 1966. I was a young reporter for NBC covering the campaign of Ronald Reagan, running for governor of California, and Pat Brown, who was the incumbent. Peter was the boy wonder of ABC News, but uh, it was a kind of meteoric rise, and it was beginning to fall for him. So he came out to California to cover uh, that campaign for ABC. We had a mutual friend who introduced us, and we got along famously from the beginning. Uh, we spent the day in Frank Sinatra's Lear Jet, which he had loaned to the campaign for the press coverage, and we had a great time going around the high desert of California making stops along the way. And at the end of that day, we really were friends, and we stayed in touch over the years. Now, you know, we were also friendly competitors. We were hotly competitive. He went off to the Middle East and to Europe, and I went to Washington. And then when he was chosen to come back as the uh, anchor of ABC News, Meredith and I gave a party for Peter and his wife to welcome them to New York. Uh, it was that kind of a relationship. I always remember that when I would get off the plane in the Middle East, there would be Peter in his bush jacket 
or on cold occasions in his trench coat saying, welcome to my part of the world, lad. He really did know <laughs> the Middle East. <laughs> He, he had a, uh, just a way about him, Tom. Uh, he was ur urbane, and, and he spent so much time in the Middle East uh, and overseas, Canadian after all. Did you, as in a competitive sense, when you sized him up initially, did you think this was a guy who was going to click with an American audience? No, I, I really didn't think of, uh, of it that way at all. I had such a high regard for his work ethic, for his determination to be seen as a working correspondent. And he had exceptional broadcasting skills, as you know. Uh, I said at one point that Peter was born to be an anchor. He came from a distinguished broadcasting family in Canada. His father was uh, the head of the news division for the CBC and the first national newscaster there. Uh, but Peter earned that role. He came to the anchor desk after all those years in the field. And I think, like the rest of us, there was always that kind of patina of insecurity, a little layer of fear that somehow we wouldn't be worthy on a day-to-day -day basis, and he was constantly trying to overcome that. Uh, going out uh, to Bosnia especially, it's a story that he effectively owned in network news, and back to the Middle East on many occasions. And then when he wrote his book, uh, he kind of discovered other parts of America that he had not spent much time in. The great thing about Peter always was that whatever project he was involved in, that was the best project. He was extraordinarily <laughs> enthusiastic about wherever he was and whatever he was doing, and he did not hesitate to let you know that. Do you think his, some of the criticism of him, of his view of the world, of his reporting, particularly on issues in the Middle East, was fair? Well, I, do, were they fair or not? I think that Peter... Uh, did see the Middle East especially uh, much more uh, through an Arab prism than a lot of American journalists did because of the relationship to the United States with Israel. And having spent so much time in that part of the world for a time, he was married to a Lebanese woman. I think that he was um, not actively determined, but he was more inclined to see both sides of that coin, as he might describe it. Tom, I'm, I've, I've wondered a lot about, you know, especially in the early years, uh, in, the, in the early 80s, when you become the anchor of Nightly News and, and he takes over for, for World News, I mean, few people can understand the sort of bond that you would share with Peter Jennings and, and Dan Rather, uh, because you have this kind of rarefied existence, and yet at the same time, uh, a kind of com competition that was unparalleled at the time, long before uh, there were blogs and websites and 24-hour news cable, what you did on the nightly news was a very competitive idea. Well, the other piece of it, and we did this intuitively, without checking with each other, we changed the DNA of these evening newscasts because we went on the road. Uh, we all felt that we were individually and collectively reporters who also had this assignment as anchors, but because of the technology, we could go to the Philippines as we did, or we could go to China, or you could go to South Africa, or you could go to Moscow quickly, ride overnight airplanes, get there, get on the air, and do the broadcast from there. So we were constantly bumping into each other on these flights or in these distant places. And at one point or another, each of us would have a beat. Dan was uh, at Tiananmen Square shortly before it blew up and stayed there longer than anybody else did. Uh, I was at the Berlin Wall the night that it came down. Peter got back to the Middle East and got some big stories there. And certainly he was in Bosnia on occasions when uh, the marketplace was blown up. So I, we didn't keep a regular scorecard, but on an irregular basis, I suppose, we kind of kept track of each other. And at the end of this long run that we had last year, as we toted it up informally among ourselves, we decided it was pretty much a dead heat and that we all made each other better at what we did. I've got to think, I was thinking about this today, Tom, that was, must be one of the sad things for you is that it strikes me you were looking forward to comparing notes on the experience now that you're no longer in the chair and have more time to think about it. And while he was still at it, he may not have been doing it more than a few years, and Dan Rather's now uh, moved on as well. But that was something that you relished, the three of you uh, who were sort of closing down an era could, could spend that time. Well, we had a dinner earlier in the year, and Ted Koppel was there as well. It was a dinner for Dan, uh, saluting him as he left the chair at, at CBS. And I got up and said, 
I got to tell you that having left the uh, nightly news anchor position, I get up in the morning now not wondering what airplane Peter is on or what airplane Dan is on. And Peter and I talked about his continuing role at ABC News. And what was most attractive to him were the special reports that he was able to do with Casey, his wife. They had a production company and they were looking forward to doing more hour documentaries. And that, of course, had real resonance with me because that's one of the reasons that I wanted to step down from Nightly News so that I could do longer form reporting. I think that we were at a stage in our lives and our careers when the daily news didn't have the same appeal as spending more time at greater length and greater depth on a single subject. Tom, for those coming of age as, as viewers and consumers of news now, will the fact that you three are no longer in the position that you were, will it change uh, the viewers of today? Will it change their understanding of the world? Will it be different in some way? Oh, I hope not, uh, David. I, I don't mean to praise you unduly, but I think you're a first-rate White House correspondent. You share the same values that I had when I was the White House correspondent. Richard Engel, who works for us in the Middle East, is one of the best young correspondents I've ever seen abroad. Jim Maceda and our other veterans, Martin Fletcher in, uh, in Israel, uh, they are still the kinds of reporters that you turn to when there's a big international crisis. And I know that Brian Williams, who succeeded me, uh, shares that view as well. America, especially now, has to look beyond its own borders because we are living in a global society. This has not been Fortress America for a long time, however you want to describe it, politically, militarily, culturally, economically. Uh, so I, I'm counting on you, David, and the next generation to come along and keep the bar high. Well, thank you for that, Tom. And thanks for joining us very much. Great to hear your, uh, your stories and your reflections. Okay, David. All My right. pleasure. And when we return tonight on Hardball, former Supreme Court nominee Robert Bork recounts his confirmation battle. This is Hardball only on MSNBC. Oscar Mayer bologna, quality meat, no fillers, and a taste that sings. You can count on Oscar. I promise. I promise. I promise to put quality into every vehicle. Like our eight awards for initial quality. And eight awards for long-term dependability from J.D. Power & Associates. I promise to help protect you with safety innovations. Like OnStar, Stabilitrack, and advanced airbags. I promise to build fuel-efficient cars. 20 cars that get 30 miles per gallon. Or better, on the highway. And I promise to bring you the best cars possible at the best possible price. That's why we're continuing the GM employee discount on almost every 2005. And now for 2006, the GM Total Value Promise. We've lowered prices, added features. Or redesigned over 50 models. So you get more without paying more on the cars and trucks you really want. It's not a promotion, it's a promise. Total value promise on 2006s. Employee discount on 2005s. Either way, it's a great value. I promise. Coming up, former nominee to the Supreme Court, Robert Borg, previews the confirmation hearings for John Roberts when Harbaugh returns. Introducing the Kia Sportage with a 10-year warranty, available V6, and advanced safety features. The SUV with everything is now for everyone. The Kia Sportage, starting around 16000 Ditech.com can save you thousands of dollars in closing costs. This is our third refinancing, and I told my husband, let me pick the finance company, because before we were paying too much for closing costs. So we went with Ditech this time with their 395 flat fee program for refi, and if there was no hidden fees, no hidden charges, and we paid just that. Get a flat fee home loan from Ditech.com. The total lender fee is just $395. Log on or call 1-800-DITECH-1. I was here before here had a name. 
As fields became farms, as grasslands became greens, and now, as families become neighbors, till after their kids become parents, I'll be here. A natural gas well, one of Kermagee's thousands, meeting energy demand in harmony with the land, with still more to explore. Try a delicious apple. Contains all the knowledge of the universe. Look, I know you're Satan. Nah. <laughs> if I eat this apple, we're gonna have to start wearing clothes and worrying about things like tax brackets and <laughs> counting carbs. So, no thanks. Hindsight is easy. It's thinking ahead that's hard. But that's how Liberty Mutual serves our customers and why we're one of the world's leading insurance companies. Put America's space program back on track and put themselves in the record books. But will future shuttle missions be grounded for good? Countdown, next on MSNBC. Rita Cosby made you a promise. We're going to break news. And when jurors from the Michael Jackson case wanted to tell their story, they told it to Rita. Do you believe that this jury let a guilty man go free? And what they're saying will shock you. The interview everyone will be talking about on the premiere of Rita Cosby Live and Direct, tonight at 9 on MSNBC. Welcome back to Hardball. The countdown is on for the first Supreme Court confirmation hearing in more than a decade. Former Supreme Court nominee Robert Bork knows firsthand about how bruising the confirmation process can be. 18 years ago, his nomination was blocked by a well-organized campaign by Democrats and liberal interest groups. He's edited a forthcoming book on the Supreme Court entitled, A Country I Do Not Recognize, A Legal Assault on American Values. And Judge Bork is here with me now. Welcome. Thank you. Let me turn back the clock to that year at the height of your confirmation battle, just after you had been uh, nominated. This was Senator Kennedy who took to the Senate floor to say this. Robert Bork's America is a land in which women would be forced into back alley abortions, blacks would sit at segregated lunch counters, and school children could not be taught about evolution. Judge Bork, why, in your judgment, were you blocked to the Supreme Court? I think they were afraid I'd be the fifth vote to overturn Roe against Wade. Simple as that? Well, that was, I think that was the main driving force. I should say about that, if you allow me a point of personal privilege, that four Supreme Court justices, Stevens, White, Chief Justice Berger, and later uh, Thurgood Marshall, all said I should have been confirmed. Now, that doesn't square with what Kennedy said about me. Were you then or are you now outside of the mainstream, your judicial philosophy? Uh, where's the mainstream? I ask you. I mean, that's why I pose the question. No, I think the, uh, the, the mainstream has always been that you interpret the Constitution according to the principles that the people who made it law understood themselves to be enacting. Uh, but that's now described as outside the mainstream. But a lot of this is just attack rhetoric that people will say anything. When you look back at the process, um, do you think that you could have done anything differently or those who were defending you could have done something differently that would have changed the outcome? Both cases. Uh, I, could have, uh, done, I could have been better at, what I, at the hearings. How so? Well, uh, you know, at the end I made that infamous remark about the fact that being on the court would be an intellectual feast, which it would have been. But it wasn't, that wasn't regarded as a politic thing to say. What did you mean at the time? I meant I would find it extremely interesting to work on the problems of the court. Mm -hmm. But um, also, there was no support. Uh, the, the, the campaign was all on the other side. They spent millions of dollars in ads and TV commercials and so forth. Uh, I must say, misrepresenting my, my uh, positions and my record. And our side had nothing of that sort at all. So it was a very one-sided campaign, and the only person speaking for me was me. And, and your detractors had been able to speak out against you, really, for an entire month that summer prior to your hearing. That's right. I think it was more than a month. Yes. When you read in, in the run-up to the nomination of Judge Roberts, the shadow of Robert Bork over the process, um, do you view that now as a helpful thing or an unhelpful thing uh, to the process now? Well, I think the process has become thoroughly corrupt because it's become politicized. Um, of course, the Supreme Court invited that. The Supreme Court has gone off outside the actual Constitution, the majority of them have. 
outside the actual Constitution to make essentially political and cultural decisions. And once you do that, once you make yourself a political institution, you're going to have a political fight over it to, to get control of it. Give me, give me two prominent examples in your mind where this court has not faithfully in, in, interpreted the original intent of the Constitution. Well, the, the most famous example is Roe against Wade. Uh, that there's nothing about the con in the Constitution about abortion, either pro or con. And a lot of people don't understand that. They think if you overrule Roe against Wade that abortion becomes illegal. It does not. It simply goes back to the states where it always has been uh, up to Roe against Wade uh, for a decision by the moral choice of the American people. The other areas are clear. I mean, pornography is one, uh, the protection of pornography by the, by the First Amendment, uh, the religion decisions trying to erase religion from our public uh, arena. Uh, I think you could go on with these things. There's a lot of them. How would America be different had Robert Bork been confirmed to the Supreme Court? Well, America would be different in the sense that Roe against Wade would have been overruled and the issue would have gone back to the people and their legislators instead of judges. You didn't consider it settled law? Uh, you know, Plessy against Ferguson announced a separate but equal doctrine as far as blacks and whites were concerned. It was overturned after I forget how many years. Uh, that was back in the, in the uh, 1800s someplace. And that was overturned in 1954 by the Supreme Court. Now, you could say Plessy was settled law. It was also wrong law, and it got overturned. Uh, you know, it has been true for throughout the history of the court that if a decision has been wrong, mm -hmm. the court does not necessarily regard it as binding precedent. And the reason for that is quite simple. When the court makes a mistake or when the court abuses the Constitution, nobody can correct it except the court. We'll leave it there. We'll take a short break, come back, and talk about the nomination of Judge John Roberts when Hardball continues only on MSNBC. It's here, Suzuki Smart Summer Savings, where more and more people are discovering Forenza. Forenza. Forenza by Suzuki. Forenza's got it all. Style, function, and America's number one warranty. And it comes with more room. And more features than Civic. Who says you can't have it all? Suzuki is on a roll with great cars, great deals, and America's number one warranty. So don't miss Suzuki's Smart Summer Savings. It was the smartest move I ever made. Forenza. Get the Forenza for just $11,994 during Suzuki's Smart Summer Savings. Verizon Broadband, the world's most advanced network, brings your employees, suppliers, and customers together so they can go about their business seamlessly. Thanks for the jest, Mom. The simple, everyday moments can be the perfect time to talk to your kids about not smoking. <laughs> so you don't have to plan a big discussion. Look, there's a dragonfly in one of the little baskets. Is your leg? Hey. A little moment will do just hey, fine. Looks really pretty. Talk to your kids about not smoking. Smoking cigarettes can hurt your game, too. You. They'll listen. Don't worry, Dad. I won't. For conversation starters, log on to philipmorrisusa.com. the road, you expect your car to perform well. But if your engine isn't clean, it may not perform at its best. Shell V-Power Premium Gasoline can help. It actively cleans your engine for better performance. So, no matter where you're going, with Shell V-Power, you'll be able to enjoy the performance. Shell V-Power actively cleans for better performance. Day after day, drop after drop, you test your blood if you have diabetes. But what if the information you're getting isn't right? If you don't code properly, your readings can be up to 43% off. 43%! And that's just a waste of all those little drops and all your efforts. So Bayer developed the Essentia Contour Meter. There's no coding needed, so you get the information you need from every single drop, every single day. The Essentia Contour from Bayer. At UMKC, we have our share of tall trees, grassy lawns, and respected scholars. Up-to-date facilities and state-of-the-art technology. Just what you want from a major university. And we have something else. A unique partnership with the city we call home. 
a city known for its livability, beauty, history, and dogged determination to get things done. A universe of knowledge in a city of opportunity. The University of Missouri, Kansas City. A great place to get a life. For a hundred years, one book has told everyone exactly where to find everything. But some people use a different book. Her book was not as up to date, which caused problems. No other book is more complete than the SBC Yellow Pages. For more ads and up-to-date listings, choose the book with SBC on the cover. We're back on Hardball with former Supreme Court nominee Robert Bork, who has just edited a new book, A Country I Do Not Recognize, A Legal Assault on American Values, and is, of course, now uh, with the Hudson Institute as well. We were talking just a moment ago, Judge, uh, about the issue of abortion. And now let's talk about Judge Roberts, whose uh, hearings will begin on September 6th. This was an answer that he provided on a questionnaire to the Senate Judiciary Committee, and he's talking about precedent. Settled law, as he's described Roe v. Wade. He writes the following, quote, Precedent plays an important role in promoting the stability of the legal system, and a sound judicial philosophy should reflect recognition of the fact that the judge operates within a system of rules developed over the years by other judges, equally striving to live up to the judicial oath. You're not much of a believer in the role of precedent in, uh, in, in constitutional law. Is your view of his answer on the question of Roe v. Wade, that he would see it as settled law, would not want to overturn it? I have no idea. Uh, I think we're going to find out in the confirmation hearings. At least they're going to try to find out in the confirmation hearings. But uh, uh, precedent is important, and, and before you overturn a decision, you ought to be very careful and make sure you think you're right. But if you think the other court has gone overboard, there's no reason to keep, uh, keep doing the, the wrong thing. You know Judge Roberts. Yes. Have you advised him no, on this I process? Would, I, I would, no. Just like asking George Armstrong Custer to advise how to deal with the Indians. <laughs> <laughs> but your experience can teach a lot. What, you believe that this is a system that's essentially corrupt in terms of the confirmation process. Yes. But how would you advise him? Do you think he faces a difficult challenge ahead? He has to devise a way, I hope, uh, and I think he will, to avoid uh, answering what he'd do in particular cases. Now, he has an advantage that uh, he hasn't written much uh, that anybody can pick on, so he doesn't have to answer, really. In my case, I had written a great deal and it was being misrepresented, so I had to go into the issues. But I would advise him not to go into the issues, and, uh, you know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg didn't go into the issues. Mm -hmm. Do you think that you could ever be confirmed? Uh, even if you had acted differently during the hearings, if you had had better support from those who put you up. In other words, can somebody like yourself, with strong views, who's documented them and discussed them, can you break through a process that is by its nature political? I think if your party controlled the Senate, you could. In my case, the Democrats controlled, controlled the Senate. Uh, so, but it's, it's a... Um, it's a hard thing to break through. If you keep t talking about the original understanding, a lot of people are upset because they have decisions they like very much, even though they don't come out of the Constitution, really, and they don't want to see them overturned. Mm -hmm. Do you think this president can be confident in the fact that he has not nominated a, an, an activist judge? I very much doubt that John Roberts will invent new constitutional rights out of, out of whole cloth, as had been done in the past. What I'm not sure about, and we'll find out, is whether he'll have the gumption to go back and try to undo some of the very bad decisions of the past. In other words, you're concerned that his view about stability, the, the role of stability in, in the life of America, may trump better judgment about the Constitution. Well, that, that is a problem. All right, Judge Robert Bork, thanks very much for being here. Before we say goodbye, we want to provide one more look at the life of Peter Jennings. This morning, with profound sadness, we report to you that Peter Jennings died last night from lung cancer. Peter Jennings was one of the most talented, caring, and successful journalists of all time. So he cared so deeply about so many things, and he had such curiosity about life, about politics, about this country, born a Canadian, became an American citizen. Peter, God bless you. A lot of Americans relied upon Peter Jennings for their news. He became a, a part of uh, the life.
life of a lot of our fellow citizens, and he'll be missed. May God bless his soul. At any rate, that's it for now in World News Tonight. Have a good evening. I'm Peter Jennings. Thanks, and good night. For all of us in this business, this was a tremendous loss. Join us again on Hardball tomorrow night at 7 p.m. Eastern for more Hardball. And later tonight on MSNBC, Rita Cosby's new show, Live and Direct, premieres tonight at 9 p.m. Eastern. And The Situation with Tucker Carlson goes live tonight at 11 p.m. Eastern. Coming to you now is Countdown with Keith Olbert. Keith? All of us in television had heard the